So we were talking about impingement, and we finally got to the kind of last form of impingement we're going to talk about, which is internal, uh, or uh, often called posterior impingement. And it's typically seen in overhead athletes and is often associated with GERD, glenoid internal rotation deficit. This really is a, is a form of impingement only seen in high performance throwers. And it's really due to the extreme forces on the humeral head in the late cocking and early acceleration phase of the throwing mechanism. And it causes an impaction on the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head against the glenoid. Uh, and this also pinches the posterior aspect of the supraspinatus tendon and infraspinatus tendon and uh, the posterior superior aspect of the labrum. So if we look at the throwing mechanism, and this is Job's version of the th throwing mechanism, published in 1992, you start up with the wind-up uh, for, for baseball. <clears throat> uh, and this is much more commonly seen in baseball than in any other sport. Uh, and then there's the, then you separate the hands, and then you get in the early cocking phase. And the late cocking phase is when you have the maximum external rotation, right before you start the uh, arm going forward to, during the acceleration phase. Then there's ball release and then deceleration after the release of the ball, and then a follow-through, and finally a finish. So this is really the stage that we're really going to be interested in, in terms of injuries to the shoulders and the elbow, when we get to the elbow. So this was a baseball game a few years ago, and the Angels were uh, leading the league, and uh, but uh, we lost to the to the Boston Red Sox in the first rounds of the playoff, and that was just a pitch that went over the uh, went over the fence, unfortunately for the for the other side. Though I'm actually kind of a Red Sox fan too. But if we go through this, we can see the different phases. So there he is with the hands together, and he's going up to the cocking phase there, and then and then there's the early cocking phase here, and then there's the late cocking phase. Now, I'd like to, each of you to try to put your arm in that position. See how far back he's able to get it? Now, now <clears throat> the most humans can't get in this position. Uh, and this is, this is a position that has to do, and he cannot get into this position with his other arm. Uh, this is a deformity which occurs in the shoulder and humerus around age, ages 15 to 13 to 15. Uh, and, and it's important for baseball throwers to allow them to get into this position. Uh, uh, because most of us will only be able to get our hand up to about this position. But if you think about it, if you put your hand in this position and you release the ball in that position, uh, you, you have a very small arc of motion in which to put acceleration on the ball. By being able to extend the shoulder back this far, that gives you almost the double the amount of arc of rotation to be able to put momentum on the ball. And that's the reason he can throw a, uh, an 88-mile-per-hour fastball, and uh, most of us will be lucky to throw a 58-mile-per-hour mile fastball. Is uh, and this is actually a a change in the bony and soft, primarily bony, but also a little bit of the soft tissue anatomy of the shoulder, which allows the throwing athlete uh, to be able to get in this position. Uh, uh, and, and then if we if we follow this through, notice that if if, if we go back a little bit. So here, if we if we go through each different uh, time period in this video. We can see it comes back and he's starting the early cocking phase there, a little bit of motion of the arm there, but notice how much motion occurs. This is the late cocking phase. Notice how much motion occurs in the next in the next second, a huge amount forward. That's the acceleration phase, and there's a huge angular acceleration of the shoulder when that occurs, and he's releasing the ball here uh, uh, to the uh, to the plate. And then the batter hits it and it goes over the fence. And so, so this is what we're looking at. Now in these development stages, there have been a number of studies that have looked at that, including one by uh, Olympus Fasti, <clears throat> uh, where what happens is that the, the normal individual uh, can uh, 
internally rotate the uh, arm here and externally rotate to approximately this position. What happens in the throwing athlete on the throwing side is that this whole thing rotates and they, they end up with an de internal rotation deficit where they can't get down to the internal rotation that we can get, but they can get much more external rotation. So this is really a shift in the rotation, and a lot of that has to do uh, with the bony deformity of the proximal humerus, where you get kind of a rotation of the proximal humerus, uh, which shifts the, uh, the arc of rotation by about 10 degrees, uh, uh, plus or minus a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so the inability to have full internal rotation is called glenoid internal rotation deficit, or GERD. There's a bony component to it, and there's also a soft tissue component to it. And it turns out that most of these players, uh, the, the night after they pitch a game, they have a lot of internal rotation deficit. But over the next three days until they get ready to pitch again, uh, a lot of that will come back to normal, which shows that there's a lot of soft tissue component to it. And this just shows when you compare the dominant to the non-dominant side uh, <clears throat> that, that you get these, these changes uh, in... Uh, and uh, uh, internal rotation. So there's a deficit in internal rotation on the dominant side, and you can see there's a significant change which occurs between about 12 and, and 16 years here. Uh, uh, John? Yes. Um, there's a considerable amount of difference uh, in anatomy um, in individuals. And is there anything unusual about the anatomy in uh, someone that can do these things the way the pitchers can? You know, I, I think there probably is, John. I think you're right that uh, people who become pitchers probably innately have different anatomy than people who are not, a not able to become pitchers. Uh, but, but I haven't seen much about that. Uh, what most of the articles that I've seen have really been about uh, the changes which occur over time in, a, in an individual uh, due to throwing. I think one of the problems being that the shoulder is probably the most complicated joint in the body. Yeah. And there's so many different parts that you don't know which part to, to, to go and, 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 and implicate. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I've always felt that the pitchers, especially, were born um, pitchers. They were not made pitchers. Well, well, that could be. I think there is a made part of it because what you can see is that there's actually a difference between the dominant and the non-dominant arms here, which is accentuated during this uh, 13, this, this early teenage years, which does not occur if they don't pitch. So I think you're right. I think that they're born with uh, the ability, just like a lot of athletes have to be born with the innate ability, uh, which is uh, a lot of which is genetic. But there's also something that, which is acquired uh, during the training process in, in early teens. Which it, it makes it, it would make me wonder if you took uh, a kid and tried to um, well. In my experience, I've, I've, I've measured everybody uh, in terms of um, size of extremities, uh -huh. uh, circum uh -huh. circumference, and I found that right-handed individuals are always larger on the right side. Left-handed individuals are usually larger on the left side, but not infrequently, they're the same size and circumference. Um, and uh, individuals that um, are um, both right and left-handed in terms of ability, uh, ambidextrous individuals, uh, they are usually um, symmetrical. Yeah, interesting. That makes so it, 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 it would seemed to me that the, and, and the pictures that I've examined um, always have been uh, larger on the, on the side that they pitch. Yeah. Um, That's... I, didn't, I, I didn't do any studies about um, individuals that uh, 
uh, that uh, were uh, uh, right and left-handed, in other words, uh, uh, e equal um, ability. Okay. Uh, those are not that frequent in, in my experience. Okay. Great, John. Good. So, uh, historically, this in, uh, internal rotation deficit was thought to primarily be due to soft tissue changes. Uh, the West, West Coast thought it was due, uh, due to uh, stretching of, of the uh, anterior capsule, uh, which allowed more external rotation. Uh, and then uh, Morgan on the East Coast thought that it was thickening of the posterior capsule. And that was a controversy for a long time. Now, kind of people believe that both of these may be occurring, but um, a more significant issue than the soft tissues is actually that you can actually see changes in the morphology of the proximal humerus between the, the pitching side and non-pitching side. And you see this only in, in throwers, and you don't see it in non-throwing uh, athletes. Uh, so, so you really get a, uh, uh, a retroversion of both the glenoid and the humerus uh, to allow the bones allow greater uh, bony uh, external rotation. <clears throat> uh, so, it, and the bottom line is that there's probably multi-factors which produce this in, in, in uh, uh, throwing athletes, both of, of which are uh, bony and soft tissue, uh, some of which may be congenital and some of which may be acquired. Uh, if you kind of look at uh, capsular laxity, uh, 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 you, you can actually show that there is some uh, capsular laxity uh, with anterior, posterior translation uh, in, in a lot of these players. Uh, and a lot of them will have thickening of the posterior capsule. So this is probably a situation where everyone is kind of right. It's just a matter of different degrees in different people and that uh, multiple theories can be correct at the same time. Stiffers and losers. Yeah, and uh, but one of the reasons why this was such a controversy, however, is the approach to uh, treating this was different depending upon your philosophy as to what you thought was most important. If you felt that capsular laxity was a dominant factor, then people would go in and do a plication. They'd cut out part of the anterior capsule, sew it back in or over sew it to one another to tighten the anterior capsule. Uh, and if you felt that it was a thickening and contraction of the posterior capsule, people would go in and do a posterior capsule release. Uh, neither of those are really done uh, co commonly now. So, uh, and then uh, there have been some studies that have been published showing that there's no evidence of posterior capsular uh, contracture in people who are asymptomatic throwers. Uh, and it's now believed that this humeral retroversion is the primary cause of the rotation shift rather than the soft tissues, though the soft tissue component is still probably a minor component. And, and again, you can see just how far these athletes can get their dominant throwing arm back uh, in order to get that increased arc of motion on the ball in order to be able to throw a, a much better ball. Now, what this causes then, this uh, hyper external rotation, is that you get impingement here in the posterior superior part of the glenoid and the humeral head, uh, which is called internal impingement. Uh, and, the, and here you can, this is kind of in a near Aber type view, and you can see well, what happens if you even get farther here in the actual throwing mechanism where you forcefully throw the, uh, the humeral head back is you get impaction between the posterior superior glenoid and the uh, posterior part of the, uh, uh, of the humerus in this location. And this is an area where uh, the bones impinge upon the insertion of the posterior aspect of the supra and the, and the infraspinatus tendon insertions here. And you can develop partial tears at the uh, rotator cuff insertions right here on the greater tuberosity. And here you can see a lot of fraying of that uh, uh, rotator cuff uh, in, in that particular area. And here's a lot of the fraying that you can get 
with this particular type of injury where that glenoid really impinges right in upon the insertion point of the rotator cuff on the greater tuberosity. So clinically, what this shows with uh, uh, GERD is you get pain with decrease in the total arc of rotation, or you, you, you get pain with GERD when you get a decrease in the total arc of rotation. Now, normally what should happen is you should have a shift, but the total arc of rotation should be the same. But when these patients start getting pain, the entire, the, the total arc is actually decreased. And then again, some people believe it's uh, due to thickening of the posterior capsule, typically treated by stretching, but occasional release, uh, or, uh, uh, or, uh, or stretching of the anterior capsule, which can be treated surgically. And typically, the, you have the most significant limitation of the rotation right after pitching, and over about three days, it tends to, to come better. Uh, so typically what these players will do to decrease this now is after they pitch, they'll immediately go and ice the shoulder, uh, which tends to decrease the amount of edema and the pain after, after pitching, uh, and then uh, do stretching exercises, uh, and then gradually warm up for, the, for three days later when they pitch again. So this is just another example showing that the, uh, the kind of normal arc of rotation and then the pitcher's arc of rotation being rotated. Now, it's funny, I was, when was this? This is 2000, it's like maybe around 2010 or something. I was up in San Francisco uh, lecturing on one of David Stolder's courses, and I opened up the paper that morning, and this was an article in the paper saying, sadly, the art of the complete game has been lost. And this was from Bruce Jenkins, who was a uh, sports writer for the San Francisco Chronicle at that time. And what he showed is that the uh, number of complete games pitched in a season was maximum back in about 1971 and has significantly decreased since then uh, to what was in the current day where it was, where it was quite uncommon for a pitcher to complete a, uh, an entire game. And he's saying how terrible this was and so forth. But the reason this occurred uh, was really twofold. Uh, the main one is that uh, a lot of pitchers were being injured and you, that you would spend millions of dollars and the, the price for a pitcher was, was going in the opposite, opposite direction here. So a price for a pitcher can be in the many tens of millions of dollars to, to, to get a pitcher. And many of them make... Uh, many tens of millions of dollars a year in their salaries. And what was happening is a lot of pitchers would pitch for only a few years, they'd get injured, and then all that investment in their pitchers was down the drain if they got injured and couldn't pitch anymore. So what uh, the team started doing is limiting the number of pitches that a pitcher had, and they found that they could significantly decrease the injury rate and increase the uh, ex uh, the time that a pitcher could stay in the major league significantly by limiting the amount of pitching that they do. So in reality, uh, this this is both to de decrease injuries and also uh, was an economic survival uh, technique for the teams that couldn't afford losing these very expensive players after only a couple of years in the major league baseball. So that's the reason why this has decreased. And I would say it's not sadly, it's actually sadly that, that they didn't start decreasing the pitches a lot sooner uh, to, to protect these athletes. Exactly, right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, another term for this because it occurs posteriorly is posterior impingement. And we look on MR for fraying of the undersurface of the posterior supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons, look for cystic changes in the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, and posterior superior labral injuries. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is a typical type injury you can get from this posterior internal impingement. This is in the uh, Aber view, and you can see where the posterior superior margin of the glenoid can impact upon the greater tuberosity, and it produces this little V impaction here. And this is in the same location and has a very similar appearance to a Hill-Sachs impaction injury. Obviously, the mechanism is different. Uh, 
the Hill Sachs injury is the anterior inferior glenoid banging into the humeral head, into the greater tuberosity. The internal or posterior impingement is the posterior superior portion of the glenoid banging in to the greater tuberosity, producing this kind of impaction defect. This is also in the same location where you get the traction cysts at the infraspinatus insertion. Uh, now, typically, if it's an impaction injury, you'll get this kind of V-shaped defect, uh, which indicates in a pitcher, it's probably internal impingement. If it's in someone who's unstable, it's probably anterior dislocation, whereas the traction injuries are more cystic changes and don't have this typical V-shaped appearance, but, but they can overlap a lot. And then you also look to see whether you have acute edema, uh, which can indicate the acuity of the lesion. Typically, with posterior impingement, you will not get a lot of bone edema because this is a very chronic process which occurs over years, whereas with an acute anterior dislocation, you can get a significant amount of bone edema. Well, that becomes normal anatomy, right, John? Right, right, yeah. And so you don't get any uh, impingement yeah. per se. Right. And then we can see the fraying of the, the rotator cuff insertion there. Uh, which also goes along with it. In this particular case, the patient has a loose body, which is not commonly seen in these. So there's the bony impaction, there's the cuff fray, and the loose body, which is not typically seen. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so it's a 14-year-old baseball catcher, two months, history shoulder pain. I believe this is uh, an arthrogram. Yeah. Um, and so first image, I'm kind of looking at the posterior labrum, doesn't look normal. And on the second image, is that what you're pointing to with the arrow, there's a little cleft of contrast extending into the posterior labrum. Um, so there's like a posterior labral tear. And then there's some tendinosis at the entrance. So this is a very subtle early internal impingement where you can see a, a little bit of, uh, of uh, injury to the uh, posterior supra and the infraspinatus insertions here. This is not in the Aber position. And uh, posteriorly here, we really shouldn't see a definite uh, uh, recess, though if you're well above the equator, you can, you can get a, a normal little recess there. Uh, but but uh, you have to be a little bit concerned about this. But this was a player who had symptoms, and uh, this was very earliest forms of uh, internal impingement. And then we can see on other images the fraying of the, uh, uh, super, of the rotator cuff tendons, the posterior supraspinatus tendon here, uh, which is part of this process. You wouldn't expect that in a 14-year-old. Uh, who wasn't undergoing this, these kind of stresses on the shoulder. And uh, here's what it looks like in a sagittal plane, that injury to the uh, posterior supra and anterior infraspinatus tendons. So that's kind of the early, very subtle changes we can see. Ashu, what do you think of this case? Sorry, I was uh, muted. It um, looks like there's, uh, along the posterior aspect of the humeral head, there's a, um, looks like maybe a defect there. Uh, looks like, yeah, there might be some early remodeling change. There's no bone marrow edema. Um, and then the posterior labrum looks uh, looks irregular and probably torn there as well. Yeah, so there's a bone impaction that, that occurs in the late cocking phase of, of throwing. Uh, there's the injury to the posterior superior labrum, which is very thickened, very blunted. We can see a little bit of a tear here with a, a separation uh, from its bony attachment and a lot of degenerative change of, of its peripheral attachments. And uh, if we take the next cut down, we can see a very abnormal morphology of that posterior labrum in this particular patient. So this is a more uh, robust form uh, uh, posterior or internal impingement in a teenage baseball player. Uh, a, a lot of baseball players will get uh, posterior labral injuries, and they can come one, if and, and by the way, the pitchers are the most common, the catchers are the second most common players to get this because they, they do a lot of throwing to second base. Uh, 
uh, in, in practicing that pitch. The outfielders are much less common. Uh, uh, there are, but the other reason why uh, these uh, pitchers tend to get uh, posterior labral injuries is uh, from uh, weightlifting uh, because uh, studies have shown that the, uh, there is a strong correlation between the strength of two muscles and how fast your fastball is. And those two muscles are uh, the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi muscles. Uh, so they do a lot of bench pressing in order to build up those muscles to increase their, the, the speed of their, their pitches. And if you do not bench press properly, uh, you can put a lot of force posteriorly on the humeral head, uh, which impacts the, the, uh, the posterior labrum. And what a lot of these bench pressers like to do is to get maximum bench presses. They, they like to let the, sh the shoulders go back and bounce the arms off the posterior labrum here so they can get a little bit more strength to do the bench press. And doing that over and over again, uh, there's a high rate of tearing of the posterior labrum uh, in these kind of weightlifters. The important thing with weightlifting is that your elbow should never go posterior to your shoulder. Uh, and then you're less likely to impinge the posterior labrum and tear the posterior labrum. But we'll see other Major League Baseball pitchers uh, when we uh, go forward with this lecture uh, who've ended their careers because of the instability from posterior labral tears, which probably occurred not from pitching, but from their uh, bench pressing and uh, weightlifting. Okay. So, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? So here on the coronal images, it does look like there's some bursal surface fraying at the anter anterior infraspinatus. And then that posterior labrum looks blunted and it's not as sharp as the anterior labrum. And then we can see there that increased signal intensity going to the posterior superior labrum. I think this could also be a case of internal impingement. So you can see this kind of uh, indentation here, very V-shaped. So you'd be worried about hill sacks injury, or in this case, it's a throwing athlete. This is uh, uh, internal impingement. You're right, this is not a normal labrum. This is more of a degenerative posterior superior labrum. And we can see there is a tear extending into the, the, to the superior labrum here. And then you can also see that there's fraying of the inferior surface of the posterior supraspinatus tendon here as well uh, due, due to injuries uh, in the cocking phase uh, against the, uh, uh, the, the distal part of the, of the, uh, ten, of the tendon here. Uh, so this, this can be due both to the cocking phase of the tendon as well as just uh, overuse uh, of, the, of, the, of the tendon itself. But this was another Major League Baseball player who had symptomatic internal impingement. Okay, Michael. Okay, so some of the similar findings in the kind of the posterior lateral humeral head kind of bony impaction and some sub, and some cystic change here at the infraspinatus insertion. And the posterior labrum itself looks intact. Maybe it's a little blunted, but it's not, you know, it's grossly intact. See in the Abra view, there's a little bit of increase. Yeah, in the Abra view, yeah, we see that linear signal. This is a major league baseball pitcher who has symptoms of uh, internal impingement. Hashi, what do you think of this case? Um, here we can see um, quite a bit of articular sided um, partial tearing of the supraspinatus, uh, maybe some delamination there, and there's been um, some some bony change and some marrow edema of the greater tuberosity there. Yeah. And so these are other changes that are characteristic of posterior impingement or internal impingement. <clears throat> Uh, and this uh, major league player. <laughs>
So on these images, there's increased signal along the posterior labrum. It looks like there may be a small osseous avulsion fragment um, of the posterior labrum and it's a tear. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a paralabral cyst. Mm -hmm. And where, where is the cyst located? In the spinal glenoid notch. And then what would you be concerned about with that? Um, you can see preferential fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So this is so probably won't catch the supraspinatus, but it's not very well. And uh, uh, what you can see more acutely is just. Uh, kind of denervation edema. Here we can see that infraspinatus muscle here does not look normal. Maybe there's a little bit of edema about it, but if we go to the coronal PD fat set images, we can see that there's significant uh, atrophy and edema involving the infraspinatus muscle. And uh, uh, the, when these players get these labral tears, they can develop cysts, which can go either to the spinal glenoid notch or the supraspinous notch. and uh, compress the nerves and actually uh, uh, develop uh, weakness and atrophy of the infraspinatus or occasionally the the, sub, the, the teres minor muscles. And uh, uh, I think I'll show either I'll show you now or later. Uh, I'll show you examples of some major league baseball pitchers where you had near near complete atrophy of one of the rotator cuff muscles, and yet there is still pitching at the major league levels, and it's probably due to the development of these paralabral cysts. So in these athletes, you really need to look for these. Uh, usually they're pretty obvious, uh, but, but, you, but you know, things are only obvious if you know to look for them. Okay, so we see multiple or cystic conglomerate along the superior aspect of the glenoid looks like it'd be in the suprascapular notch. Um, it's going to be probably paralabral in etiology, so you suspect adjacent paralabral or, or labral tear. Now we see defect in the posterior labrum, and there's you can see the actual fluid extending to that to the uh, spinal glenoid notch. So this is the posterior superior labrum. Maybe a little bit into the supraspinous notch. And what else do you see? Um, so we also see increased signal within the infraspinatus muscles. It's going to be like at least, you know, atrophy or early de uh, denervation. You see denervation and edema here uh, due to the compression on the nerve. On the sagittal images here, you can see abnormal increased signal intensity, maybe a little bit of atrophy, but here's where that cyst is, and we certainly have neuropathic changes within that infraspinatus muscle. Right. Okay. Ashu, what do you think of this case? I got closer to the mic, John. Okay. Um, just looking here, uh, well, uh, are we talking about the humeral head here? I think this is just normal hematopoietic marrow. Well, this, um, this is a, a young player, and this is hematopoietic marrow here, primary fatty marrow of the, of the epiphysis. Uh, but, but what do you see back in here? Oh, yeah, there's some early hibernation and cystic change of the posterior glenoid. Um, almost looks like, you know, it's just probably just chronic impaction. Yeah, and here, here we can see it in the coronal plane. And this, and this is, this is uh, internal, uh, internal impingement uh, and uh, a, a teenage throwing athlete here. Where here, instead of getting the, the other changes that we talked about, he just has an impaction against uh, the humeral head against the posterior superior glenoid. Uh, 
with these subchondrocystic changes from repetitive traumatic injury. Okay, good. So here we see lots of cystic changes and edema-like marrow signal intensity along the posterior superior humeral head. It looks like a chronic stress reaction. Um, stress and more repetitive impact. Repetitive. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it looks like there may be some articular surface fraying of the infraspinatus right adjacent to that and there's a blunting of the posterior superior glenoid or posterior superior labrum mm -hmm. yeah it's a big tear the labrum is pulled off mm -hmm. so you have a big defect so this was on 10 07 this was a major league baseball pitcher uh, and these are all the classic findings that you now would immediately call internal impingement or posterior impingement uh, so let's see, this is 10807. Okay, uh, that was at the end of the season. Now he came back the next year and now has uh, uh, symptoms again that, that developed kind of the midway into the season. He was a uh, pitcher. Okay. Um, so here we so here that posterior superior labrum it doesn't look as bad as before, but he is starting to develop some edema again in that posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. And is that there may be a increased articular surface tearing of the infraspinatus? It almost looks like part of that tendon's retracted, but I can't tell on just these two images. So what we see is a lot of the kind of the cystic edema pattern we saw at the end of the season has kind of resolved. But he does have that characteristic impaction injury here. And he's got actually increase in the labral tear separation back here. Uh, and then, right, the, there's a lot of fraying and the regularity of the uh, infraspinatus. This is, okay, and here's a sagittal image. Here we can see marked fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus, just absent. And I don't see any cysts on this image. Yeah, supraspinatus and teres minor are intact. So this, this was kind of chronic end stage. Uh, okay, and then so now in the off season he had surgery. They waited till the end of the season. He wasn't really able to pitch for the rest of that year. Uh, the and but then he had uh, uh, surgery and he tried to come back the next year. And uh, this is what it showed. So you can see suture anchors in the labrum. So he's had a labral repair in the interim. Um, it looks like there's improved signal. I don't see as much fraying in the infraspinatus and I don't see as large of an impaction deformity, but um, recurrent. Is that the surgeons on the West Coast did, told him that they, he shouldn't have surgery because it wouldn't work. He went back to the East Coast, had labral surgery, and you can see that soon into the season, uh, he retoured the posterior labrum. And by July, it couldn't play anymore. And his repeated MR scan at that time showed that he had the labral repair, but it was completely torn again uh, by, by mid-season. You can see a lot of thickening of the labral attachment here. OK, so this is uh, internal impingement uh, in, uh, in overhead throwing athletes. OK, well, why don't we?